Thank you for inviting me, for organizing this workshop with this uh, very exciting theme. So yeah, like Andrew said, I'll take you a little bit more to the periphery of the Bantu-speaking area. We'll move outside of uh, East Africa now. Uh, but I, I think we'll see that there's a lot of similarities, but also some interesting differences, and that the East Africa example can give us ideas about how contact in Southern Africa works and vice versa. Um, so the research that I'm presenting is part of an ongoing research project on uh, language contact between uh, Bantu speakers and Khoisan speakers in uh, Southern Africa, uh, which started last year. So the results that I'm presenting here are sort of uh, preliminary, which is why I'm very much looking forward to your input, not only about the results that I present, but also about further research ideas and further ideas of how to study Southern African Bantu, non-Bantu language contact. So what I want to talk about, uh, I will very briefly introduce uh, Khoisan languages, uh, since I am the first to, uh, aside from Lutz's little intermezzo, the first to speak extensively about Khoisan languages, a very brief introduction on Southern African Bantu languages, and then we will look at a number of cases of Bantu Khoisan language contact. Uh, we'll look at contact in the lexicon, in the phonology, but I want to focus on one particular case study, which is uh, the use of clicks in uh, Nguni languages, and particularly uh, the history of how and when these sounds were incorporated in the languages. And we'll end with some conclusions and mainly outlooks for, for the research. So Khoisan languages, uh, the most common definition nowadays is that Khoisan languages do not form a single language family. Uh, Greenberg, in his uh, classification of the languages of Africa, proposed Khoisan as one of the four language phyla. Um, but uh, more extensive data collection and analysis has shown that the similarities that we do see between Khoisan languages uh, do not really point towards a genetic relationships, but are more likely the result of uh, convergence, are the result of language contact. So we do keep the term Khoisan, but we now use it to refer to uh, languages and make use of phonemic click consonants, and that are not obviously part of another language family. You find clicks in Bantu languages, you find clicks in one East African Cushitic language, but all other la African languages with phonemic clicks are part of Khoisan. Um, if we do take a genetic point of view, in Southern Africa you have three language families uh, belonging to uh, this Khoisan group. Um, you have the, the ones that used to be called uh, Northern Khoisan and that have been renamed the Kha languages. So these are the ones in uh, the north, basically. You have the Kwekwadi language family, which is spoken in Botswana, Namibia, and formerly along the South, uh, South African coast, and you have the Southern Khoisan languages, or the two languages which were spoken in the South African and Botswana interior. There's two other Khoisan languages in East Africa, which I'm sure you're uh, more aware about than I am, uh, but they don't, uh, do not really play a role here. So the, the geographical distribution that is shown on this map is uh, very optimistic and very historical because the uh, cu current distribution of Khoisan languages is much more restricted. Um, it's probably not an exaggeration to say that all Khoisan languages are endangered. Um, many Khoisan languages have become extinct recently. Um, so we know that there used to be Kwekwe spoken in the Cape in South Africa that has become extinct in the 19th or 20th century. The same thing happened with uh, Kora in South Africa, with the Kwadi in Angola, probably in the 60s or 70s of the last century. Uh, um, the same fate occurred for many of the two languages in South Africa. And uh, this extinction process is still ongoing, so we have uh, many Khoisan languages that have very small numbers of elderly speakers. So for instance, Ntu was considered to be extinct for a long time until a very enthusiastic anthropologist uh, went to remote areas in South Africa and tracked down, at that time in 2002, there were 12 elderly speakers of the language who were not aware of each other, who didn't know that they were not the only ones still knowing the language. These were obviously all very old, so I think the last count is that there are still five speakers left of this language. There is a very big documentation and preservation and revitalization uh, project going on, but unless that is, has unprecedented success, this language will very soon become extinct. 
Uh, same is uh, the case for uh, Tramque, uh, which also is called uh, Tquan in uh, Botswana, which has some 30 speakers, all of, uh, older than 50. So again, that language will also probably disappear within a generation. And there's many other examples, of course, on languages um, being equally uh, marginal. The only reasonably vital course on language is Kwekwe, spoken in Namibia, which has a couple hundred thousand speakers and which has a lot of institutional uh, support. So it has an official orthography. It is taught in schools. You can study it up to university level. Um, but even this language doesn't have a very high status. Um, for all the other Khoisan languages, their speakers are very marginalized communities, very small communities. They don't have a very high socioeconomic position in the, in the uh, countries, in the societies where they live, and they are undergoing language shift uh, nowadays mainly to uh, Afrikaans, um, in Botswana uh, mainly to uh, Tswana. <coughs> so although Khoisan languages are still spoken in uh, southern Africa, the current state of Khoisan languages is uh, not very optimistic. Um, so what do we have in terms of Bantu languages in southern Africa? Bant southern African Bantu languages are mainly zone S and zone R. So we have the uh, Shona languages in Zimbabwe, Venda. We have the uh, Sutu languages in the interior and the Nguni languages along the coast. And uh, the zone R languages are mainly in Namibia. Now, there's two groups that I want to focus on a little bit more because they're most interesting when it comes to Khoisan contact. Uh, so those are the S30 languages, the Sutu languages, um, spoken in the area in green here, as well as in Botswana. And the uh, Nguni languages, the S40 languages, which are spoken here uh, along the coast. Moving on to uh, Bantu Khoisan language contact. Well, first, there are a number of reasons um, why studying Bantu Khoisan language contact is difficult. Um, may, first of all, many Khoisan languages are not documented at all or are not documented well. So it's difficult to find enough data for comparison because we don't know very well what uh, these Khoisan languages look like. And for many Khoisan languages, it's already too late. These Khoisan languages are, uh, are extinct. And uh, we do not even know how many Khoisan languages have become extinct in the past because this process of language shift to uh, Bantu languages has probably been going on for centuries. So there may have been many more Khoisan languages than we will ever know about. What also makes it difficult is that many of these Khoisan languages that were documented, even though they are extinct now, were documented at the stage when they were already at the verge of dying out. So one of the remarks that many uh, linguists made studying Khoisan languages in the early 20th century is that Khoisan languages are very imprecise, have a lot of phonological variation, and um, of course with all sorts of racist overtones of uh, what was wrong with these people. Uh, but what we know now is that this is not a typical feature of Khoisan language. It is a typical feature of a language at the verge of extinction. So even what we know about extinct Khoisan languages is not necessarily very reliable. Um, what also makes it difficult not to establish Khoisan influence in Bantu, but to establish the particular Khoisan language that is responsible for the influence, is that Khoisan languages have been in extensive contact with each other for a very long time and uh, share many uh, grammatical and lexical features. So even if we do find uh, features in Bantu languages that are of course an origin, it's often very difficult to say which particular course on language they derive from. Um, so keeping that in mind, we can still establish quite a few uh, cases of course on influence on Bantu languages. <coughs> Uh, we see a lot of course an influence in the lexicon. Um, yeah, and we, uh, I, will, I will come to specific cases of uh, course an influence in the lexicon later, but we'll see there are some loan words and also cases of semantic extensions where the word wasn't borrowed, but the meaning was changed as a result of language contact. Um, the most obvious uh, case of course an influence on southern Bantu languages is of course the acquisition of uh, clicks. 
which again I will come to later. But cliques are not the only case of phonological influence from Khoisan on Bantu. Uh, Southern Bantu languages have very rich uh, phoneme inventories in general. Uh, even if you factor out uh, the cliques, they have uncommon consonants such as ejectives. They have many affricates, and many uh, Southern Bantu languages also have heterogenic affricates, which are not very common. Um, they make use of features such as a uh, breathy voice, and uh, linked to that, they also have uh, depressor consonants. Now, depressor consonants, um, which I hope you're all aware, are consonants uh, of a particular class that have a lowering effect on the tone of the following vowel. Um, and uh, these are cross-linguistically not necessarily uncommon. There's also um, a phonetic explanation for that. Um, but in Bantu languages, you do not find them that often. There are basically two areas where you find depressor consonants. There's the Michikenda languages in East Africa, and there are the Southern African Bantu languages. Now, in the Michikenda languages, you have depressor consonants of the kind that you would expect. Uh, the voiced obstruents act as depressor consonants, and cross-linguistically, that is the most common type of depressor consonant. So that seems to be a very fairly natural development. But in Southern Africa, you find many more depressor consonants than just voiced consonants. You find aspirates, and you even find um, voiceless, unaspirated uh, plosives acting as depressor consonants, which is cross-linguistically very rare. Uh, now, and you also find cases, for instance, in some Shona varieties, where you have a sort of um, phonemic opposition between a depressor and a non-depressor phoneme, where the, uh, the phonemes themselves are segmentally not different, but their only difference is whether or not they have a depressing effect. Now, all of this is quite strange, uh, both from a Bantu perspective and from a cross-linguistic perspective, but again, Khoisan languages do love to do these kinds of things. Khoisan languages are also tonal, and their tones very much interact with um, the features of uh, consonants and also in ways that are cross-linguistically not very common. So, for instance, this opposition between a depressor and a non-depressor uh, phoneme is also something that you find in certain Khoisan languages. So this is also um, a phonological feature that may have developed in uh, Bantu language under the influence of Khoisan languages. We find some Khoisan influence on Bantu uh, morphology. Uh, we, and we find influence of two types. One of the types is what uh, Lutz discussed earlier based on the work of Tom Guldman, where you have these suffixes chromaticalized as a result of language contact, so I won't go into that. Uh, but you also find cases um, where actual uh, morphemes, so actually the form of the morpheme, was borrowed from a Khoisan language into a Bantu language. And you actually only find two, I only found two languages where this happens, which is uh, Ye and uh, Tosa. So the examples are uh, on your handout on the first page. Uh, Ye has borrowed a uh, causative suffix from uh, a neighboring Khoisan language, probably a Khoi language. And it has borrowed both uh, the form of the suffix, uh, so the form is very, diff very similar in Ye and in uh, the source language, as well as its function, namely being a causative suffix. And we also have two examples in Khoisan, uh, where a feminine suffix was borrowed and an adjectival suffix. <coughs> These cases are both fairly marginal. So in ye, for instance, um, you also have a native causative suffix, which looks like it has a proper bound to origin, and the native causative suffix is more productive than a borrowed one. And uh, the same goes for klasa. So for instance, klasa also has a native Bantu uh, prefix for deriving uh, female personal names, which is, again, more um, productive than this borrowed suffix. So there is some borrowed morphology, but it's limited. It's, you don't find it in many languages, and when you do find it, it's not very productive. Uh, in terms of syntax, um, so far, uh, both in my own research and in other published research, I haven't seen any convincing cases of Khoisan influence on uh, Bantu syntax, um, which is slightly surprising. If you find a lot of uh, foreign influence in the phonology, you might expect some kind of influence in the syntax as well. Um, I don't want to speculate too extensively about the explanations for this, but one possible explanation could be um, that 
the syntax of Khoisan languages was already quite similar to the syntax of uh, Bantu language. So for instance, two of those three Khoisan language families have the same basic word order as Bantu languages. So even if you would expect uh, changes in that kind of area, you can't have them because the similarity was already there. Okay, so looking a bit, a bit more extensively at Khoisan influence in the lexicon of Bantu languages, uh, well, first of all, what's the interest of lexicon? Um, because on the one hand, uh, lexical influence, uh, loan words happen in all kinds of language context situations, even in very superficial ones. Um, so this might not tell you very much about the kind of context situation that you have. Um, but in the case of Southern Africa, um, looking at loan words is very useful because it can help you prove that contact between specific languages has taken place. And since so many of these Khoisan languages are now extinct or have a smaller distribution now than they did in the past, these loan words might be the only proof that we have that these languages were at some point in contact. Uh, what's also interesting about loan words is if you have loan words in specific semantic domains, this might tell you something about the kind of interactions that uh, the speakers of these two language communities have. So to give some examples of that, uh, we see lots of loan words in uh, the Nguni languages, the S40 languages. So the Nguni word for a, a polecat, which is this cute animal here, uh, was borrowed from a Khoisan language, the same goes for the Tasa word for a wildebeest, which is this fairly ugly animal here, <laughs> um, uh, which also uh, uh, in the end ended up in Afrikaans as the word gnu, uh, which also ended up in Dutch that way. So we, Dutch has a Khoisan loan word uh, through a number of intermediate steps. Uh, we also have the word for old man, which is borrowed from a Khoisan language, the word for berry, the word for wheat. Um, so we see a number of not necessarily all very interesting or very unexpected examples of uh, Khoisan borrowings in these Nguni languages from a variety of different Khoisan languages. What's more interesting is that these Khoisan languages that are the supposed donor languages are not necessarily all spoken very close to where Nguni languages are spoken now. Uh, so these are the four uh, Khoisan languages from which I could find loanwords, and uh, only Tekwi, uh, all of these languages are, with the exception of Gu, are extinct, but the attested location of Khekwi is sort of on the border of the Nguni-speaking area, but the other three are very much outside the current Nguni-speaking area. So a couple of explanations, either these Khoisan languages had a wider distribution, uh, it's also possible, but not very likely, that the Nguni languages had a wider distribution, or it's possible that these are not the exact donor languages, but a related language. So this can help us to prove that, or to suggest that contact between these language communities may have taken place. Now, if we look at the, the semantics of these loan words, um, in Kosa you find a lot of loan words from Kwekwe, from one particular Khoisan language, and these, some of these are fairly basic. So we find some basic vocabulary on the basis of the Leipzig Jakarta basic vocabulary list. Um, and we also find so, uh, quite a few words for uh, body parts, which you might also consider fairly basic. Um, so the, this contact is fairly, um, this lexical influence is fairly extensive. Um, we also see a lot of Kwekwe loanwords in Kosa uh, uh, when it comes to religion. Uh, so we see um, some words that particularly refer to Christian religion. Uh, so the Tosa word for church comes from the Kwekwe word for to meet or to assemble. And uh, the Tosa word for convert to Christianity comes from the Kwekwe word to uh, convert. And what's interesting here is that the Kwekwe source is not particularly Christian, but the semantic narrowing to a Christian context happened in Tosa only. We also see a number of Kwekwe loan, loan words in Tosa that are not particularly Christian, but have a wider religious or spiritual uh, meaning. The word for God, the word for a doctor, which is not a purely medical thing, but also has uh, a lot of religious connotations, and the word for to be circumcised. Now, we know that Kwekwe-speaking interpreters uh, worked closely with Dutch-speaking colonists in um, uh, coming into contact with the Tosa population, so it's not necessarily unexpected that um, the Tosa words for uh, Christian religion went via Kwekwe. 
Um, but the fact that we don't only find uh, Christian religious terms, but also wider religious terms, might suggest that these Kwekwe speakers already had some kind of uh, prestige when it came to religious matters, and that Kwasa speakers were more ready to uh, accept religious input from these uh, Kwekwe speakers. <coughs> now, if we compare that to another Bantu language in southern Africa that has taken up Khoisan loanwords, we see quite a different picture. So looking at uh, Tswana, one of the Sutu languages, the S30 languages, you find a lot of Khoisan loanwords in this language, but mainly for uh, plants and animals. So the kind of loanwords that you might expect in, these, in a situation where migrants come into contact with a resident population. What's interesting here is that you see some, uh, same as we see, uh, saw in some of the Tosa examples, you see some semantic narrowing. So the Tswana word for um, meaning ostrich eggshell beads, so pr uh, a very specific meaning, comes from a queer word with a much more general meaning of egg. Uh, same goes for the word for lake, which comes from a word for water. And uh, the word for a specific kind of alcoholic drink made out of honey comes from a word meaning uh, alcoholic drink in general. So this semantic narrowing might tell us something about the kind of context in which these words were borrowed. For instance, uh, the borrowing of the word for alcohol to mean a specific kind of alcohol might mean that making this particular kind of drink was something that they acquired from the donors of this word. So we see Khoisan loanwords in uh, Tswana, and we also see Khoisan loanwords in uh, languages related to, to Tswana. Um, so the other language, uh, Sutu languages such as Southern Sutu and uh, Pedi. Uh, so on the left and also on your handout, you have the words in different Sutu languages, and on the right you have the Khoisan, uh, the supposed Khoisan donor word. So how do we explain the fact that you find Khoisan languages in a number of related Sutu languages? Uh, it could be the result of individual borrowing events, but that's quite unlikely because of the Sutu languages, only Tswana is actually still in contact with these Khoisan languages. And the other Twa Sutu languages in which these words occur are no longer in contact with them. So another explanation is that these words have a certain time depth and that they actually go back to a stage of proto Sutu Tswana. Uh, and this seems the most likely explanation because if you follow regular sound correspondences, you can actually reconstruct some of these loan words to proto Sutu Tswana. Um, and it's also been suggested that uh, proto Sutu Tswana was spoken at some point in the area that is now eastern Botswana, so quite close to where these Khoisan languages, where the words come from, are spoken uh, nowadays. So it could be that these words and their reconstructability suggest that they were integrated in an earlier stage of the language and that this language contact was therefore fairly old. Uh, if we go back even further, it's been suggested that the Sutu languages are closely related to the Makua languages, uh, which might be surprising because they're spoken in northern Mozambique, but there are some uh, intriguing sound changes that are shared between these two language groups. And there are even a couple of these uh, Khoisan borrowings in the Sutu languages that you also see in uh, Makua languages. So the time depth could be even more. <coughs> so we see Khoisan loanwords. We see particular lexical uh, borrowings. Uh, but we also see uh, changes in lexical semantics that may be due to uh, language contact. And the particular case that I want to discuss is the development of a polysemy pattern where you have one word meaning both blood and money. Now, this polysemy pattern is very common in Khoisan languages spoken all across the Kalahari Desert. So I've given three examples here of three unrelated Khoisan languages and also three unrelated lexemes, but they all have this exact same meaning. Uh, now, it's quite likely that the fact that the, you have this polysemy shared across unrelated Khoisan languages is the result of uh, convergence, because we see this a lot. We see a lot of shared polysemy patterns. But we also see it in a number of Bantu languages spoken in the same area. So we have it in Tswana, the word madi, meaning both blood and money. Uh, the same is true for the Kalahadi word mari. Um, you also see it in Yei, where the word Maropa means both blood and money, and in uh, Mbukushu with the word uh, Maninga. 
So all these words are words of ha that have a proper Bantu origin. They, these all have Bantu reconstructions. And uh, all those reconstructions are, have the semantics of blood only. Um, so it seems that developing an additional meaning of money is the result of contact influence from these Khoisan languages that had this particular polysemy pattern. Uh, so just to show it to you on a map, uh, the red dots are languages, either Khoisan or Bantu, that have this polysemy, and the gray ones are languages that don't have it. So it really seems to follow an aerial pattern rather than a genetic pattern. <coughs> So just to sum up what lexicon can tell us about Khoisan influence in Bantu, uh, we do see Khoisan loanwords in many Bantu languages. I've only shown you a couple, but there's many more. Um, but there are large and telling differences in where the, uh, which particular Khoisan language the word comes from. So Khosa has mainly acquired Khoikhoi loanwords, but Swana has acquired loanwords from all sorts of different Khoisan languages. Uh, in the number of loanwords, uh, Tosa has gone fairly crazy with its uh, Kwe Kwe adopt, uh, um, adoptions, whereas Tswana has kept it much more limited, and also in the semantic domains. And uh, the fact that some loanwords are shared across multiple Bantu languages raises interesting questions about how and when these words were integrated, if it uh, is a result of different um, contact events that just happen to involve the same source language, or if this is the case of integration into an earlier stage of the language. Okay, moving on to uh, the second uh, domain where we see Khoisan influence in the phonology. Uh, clicks have always been, uh, uh, from very early on, been recognized as um, a case of Khoisan influence on uh, Bantu. Um, because they're very unique cross-linguistically, you only find them in Khoisan languages, in Bantu languages of Southern Africa, in uh, uh, this one particular Cushitic language, and uh, there is a case of a ritual, sort of ritual language spoken in Australia that also makes use of uh, clicks, but aside from that, uh, that is all the clicks, we, phonemic clicks that we have in the languages of the world. So they're very close, they're cl very clearly linked to Khoisan languages which is lucky for us because then we can tell that if a Bantu language has clicks, a Khoisan language is ultimately responsible. Um, so showing that this is a result of language contact in the case of clicks is very easy, fortunately. Now we have a lot of Bantu languages with clicks, but not all of them have them. We basically have two groups of Bantu click languages. We have uh, a group in the south, which is mainly the Nguni language and one Sutu language, Southern Sutu. And we have a group in the north, uh, which is uh, the three closely related Kavango languages. Uh, and then we have Fue and we have Ye. So clicks don't necessarily follow genetic Bantu subgroupings. Um, yeah. So although it's clear that the occurrence of clicks in Bantu languages is ultimately the result of Khoisan influence, there's also a lot that we just don't know about how clicks entered these Bantu languages. So for instance, what we don't know is why did some Southern African Bantu languages adopt clicks and others didn't? Uh, can we even be sure that they never had clicks? Or uh, is it possible that they had them and lost them? And uh, are, are we able to tell? Um, even if we look at Bantu languages that do have clicks, why do you see large differences in um, the number of clicks? Because you have Bantu languages that have only three or four phonemic clicks, and you have Bantu languages with more than 20 phonemic clicks. So why are there these large differences in the functional load of clicks? Uh, another question that I think was raised by Martin earlier is that why are there no clicks in Eastern African Bantu languages? Because you also do find uh, Khoisan languages there. Um, so why did these not, this contact not result in the adoption of clicks in uh, Bantu? And um, the question that I want to focus on in the case study now is um, when, uh, yeah, more when than how did clicks enter Southern African Bantu languages? Did this happen one language at a time? So is every Bantu language that has clicks, has it been an individual contact with some kind of Khoisan language? Uh, or did this happen in an earlier stage of the language, at some kind of proto-state? Or has there been a cases of Khoisan Bantu Bantu transfer? So Khoisan, um, a Bantu language borrowed clicks from a Khoisan language, and then another Bantu language borrowed clicks from that 
Bantu language. Because we know that this happens, we see this happening nowadays. Um, uh, Social linguistically very strong Bantu languages clicks is Zulu. And um, there are many smaller Bantu languages that are borrowing some clicks from uh, Zulu. So, for instance, some southern Mozambican languages that are in contact with Zulu are borrowing some Zulu clicks. And these are not in direct contact with uh, Khoisan languages. <coughs> so even though we know that clicks in Bantu are the ultimate Khoisan result, there may have been intermediate steps. Um, so this is the question that I want to look at, and particularly by looking at clicks in the Nguni languages. Um, so the Nguni languages, the S40 languages, uh, are very closely related. It's been, um, it's been suggested that they, these are not separate languages, but rather dialects. Um, well, that's a political question that's really not very relevant right now, um, but it's most common to recognize at least a number of distinct uh, Nguni languages. Um, and all these Nguni languages have clicks. There's one exception, which is uh, Northern Ndebele, which used to be called Northern Transvaal Ndebele or Sumayela Ndebele. This is all the same language. Um, this is the only Nguni language that doesn't have clicks, but we know, or yeah, we know that these clicks were lost fairly recently because in uh, earlier descriptions from the 1950s, uh, it's told that uh, there are some elderly speakers of the language that still remember certain words with clicks. Um, so aside from Northern Debele, which lost clicks, uh, clicks are all over Nguni, and uh, click words are also very widely shared across the Nguni languages. <coughs> so I now want to present a sort of case study of trying to understand when and how did these clicks enter the Nguni languages. Um, and there's a number of different hypotheses that I want to test. So, first of all, it's possible that clicks were borrowed into uh, Proto-Nguni. Um, so, uh, since these are very closely related languages, we uh, assume that at some stage they formed a single uh, ancestral language, and it's possible that clicks entered into these ancestral languages, so before they broke up into individual Nguni languages. Now, if this is the case, then we would expect click words to be shared between different Guni languages, and we would expect there to be regular sound correspondences because they would have been transmitted from the mother language to individual daughter languages. It's also possible that click words diffused from one Nguni language to another. So one Nguni language got clicks, presumably through Khoisan contact, and then other Nguni languages borrowed them from this particular Nguni language. Now, if this is the case, then we would also expect click words to be shared uh, among Guni languages, but we would not expect there to be regular sound correspondences, because if words are borrowed, then these sound changes no longer regularly apply. Now, and there's a third possible uh, explanation, which is that clicks were borrowed uh, into individual Guni languages. So each Nguni language that has clicks has been in individual contact with Khoisan, and in that case we would not expect click words to be shared very extensively. Now, and I want to argue for the first explanation, that clicks were borrowed into Proto-Nguni. Uh, a very brief introduction on the clicks in Nguni languages. Uh, Nguni languages make use of no more than three click types, or places of articulation. You have the dental, the alveolar, and uh, the lateral. And these click types combine with a number of click accompaniments. Um, and the maximal type of click accompaniments that I found in Nguni languages are the voiceless, the voiced, which is sometimes described as uh, breathy voiced. Uh, I assume this is, the, this is the same kind of feature, but if you want to, I can argue that more, more extensively. Uh, you find nasalized clicks, aspirated clicks, you find clicks that are described either as pre-nasalized or as nasalized and breathy voiced. Um, you find pre-nasalized voiceless clicks and you find nasalized aspirated clicks. Now, not all Nguni languages has all, have, has all of this. I don't think any Nguni language has all of this, but this is the kind of features of clicks that you find in Nguni languages. Um, so let's compare the click inventories of uh, Nguni languages that we find. I don't know if I put this... Yeah, this is also on the handout if that's more easy for you to follow. So Tosa has uh, three click types, dental, alveolar, and lateral, the ones that you'd expect, and they have six click accompaniments, so that results in a system of 18 different click phonemes. 
If you compare that with uh, Swati, Swati ha also has six click accompaniments, but it misses two of the three click types. It doesn't have alveolar or lateral ones, it only has dental ones. There are a number of Mguni languages that have the same click inventory, so Zulu and the Bele spoken in Zimbabwe, Lala and Pakta, they all have three click types and five accompaniments, so if you compare them to, for instance, Kosa, there's one accompaniment that they're missing, so these all have 15 click phonemes. So then the Bele is a bit of a difficult case, it clearly doesn't have a lateral click, uh, it also lacks the voiceless pre-nasalized click, but people differ on whether or not it has a voiced pre-nasalized click, so it has either four or, uh, sorry, either eight or ten uh, click phonemes. Uh, Putti is also a, diff a difficult case. It definitely has three click types, um, but we don't know if it has four or five click accompaniments. Um, so the proto-Nguni click inventory that I want to propose consists of uh, four click types and four click accompaniments. So um, I, I want to argue that proto-Nguni had dental, alveolar, lateral, and palatal clicks, and it had voiceless, voiced, aspirated, and uh, nasal click accompaniment. So it had a click inventory of 16 click phonemes. Okay, so why do we think that? Because we see uh, a lot of comparative series, and at the end of your handout, you uh, will see even more comparative series. In fact, you will see all the ones that I have. Um, where click, uh, click words show very regular correspondences between individual Nguni languages. So we have a word for an earring, uh, which is ikritri in Zulu, in Kosa, in uh, uh, two types of Ndebele, in Swati and in uh, Puti. The difference is only in the form of the noun class prefix. Uh, so this word is widely shared across Nguni languages, and we can simply reconstruct this as ikritri in Proto-Nguni. So that is some evidence for the reconstruction of a voiceless dental click. We can also reconstruct um, voiceless alveolar clicks. Uh, you find these in any Nguni language that has alveolar clicks. Uh, Swati doesn't have alveolar clicks as we have seen, and in Swati these alveolar clicks regularly correspond to dental clicks. So the word for it to become strong is realized with an alveolar click in all the Nguni languages, with the exception of Swati, where it's realized with a dental click. <coughs> and um, again, if you look at the back of your handout, you can see that there are many other cases of voiceless alveolar clicks in other Nguni languages corresponding to voiceless dental clicks in Swati. Uh, we also reconstruct voiceless lateral clicks, and um, again, these are maintained in the Nguni languages that still have lateral clicks, and in the Nguni languages that lost lateral clicks, such as Sadin, Ndebele, and Swati, these have been changed to dental clicks. So these three click types, dental, alveolar, and lateral, these are common in the uh, living Nguni languages, but um, we also want to reconstruct a palatal click, and these are not found in any of the living Nguni languages, so we need a bit more evidence for that. And the reason why I want to reconstruct a palatal click in Nguni is because uh, there is a correspondence between a palatal stop in Tosa and a dental click in other Nguni languages. We really get into some hardcore historical linguistics right now, so please bear with me while we go through this. Um, so we have a number of cases where you have a Tosa word with uh, a palatal stop, Jeba, which corresponds to a word with a dental click in other Nguni languages. So Tosa Jeba corresponds to Zulu Treba. Um, other examples, Tosa uh, Ikala uh, corresponds to Ikala in other Nguni languages. Choba corresponds to Toba. Uh, so it could be that Tosa uh, has simple ch simply changed its dental clicks to palatal stops. But this is not the case because Tosa still has dental clicks and these dental clicks correspond to dental clicks in other Nguni languages. So if you go back to the example of the earring, Tosa uh, ikritri corresponds to ikritri in other Nguni languages. So Tosa tje corresponds to t in other Nguni languages, and Tosa t uh, also corresponds to t in other Nguni languages. Um, 
what was I going to say here? So this is another example of this uh, dental click correspondence. <coughs> so basically we have a classic historical linguistic problem um, where we have this correspondence and how do we explain this? There's two possible explanations. Either there's one proto nguni phoneme that split in Klosa and was maintained in the other Nguni languages, or we had two proto nguni phonemes which were maintained in Klosa and merged in the other Nguni languages. Um, so first looking at the, the first option, the option of split in Klosa, well, if we want there to have been a phonemic split, there has to have been a conditioning environment, and we don't find any, because we find a dental-click-dental-click dental -click correspondence in the exact same uh, phonological environment as the palatal stop dental-click correspondence. So Klosa Treba corresponds to Zulu Treba, and Klosa Treba corresponds to Zulu Treba. So given that there's no conditioning environment, there cannot have been a phonemic split. So there must have been two different proto nguni phonemes, and Klausa is the only one who kept them apart, and all the other Nguni languages have merged them. So the, there was a proto nguni dental click, which was maintained in all the languages, and there was a proto nguni other type of click, which was changed to a palatal stop in Klausa and which was changed to a dental click in other Nguni languages. Um, so why, why do I call this a palatal click? Uh, well, it makes a lot of sense for a palatal click to change to a palatal stop. All you need to do is stop the ingressive airstream. Uh, and we also know that Khoisan languages have undergone the same kind of sound change. Palatal clicks there have also developed into palatal stops, and we even see some proto nguni words that I reconstruct with palatal click that have a Khoisan source, uh, that come from a Khoisan uh, source word that also has a palatal click. So that was in a nutshell why we want to reconstruct four different click types for proto nguni. Um, we also uh, reconstruct four different click accompaniments, the voiceless, the voice, the aspirated, and the nasal. And if you compare that to the click inventories of modern Guni languages, um, there's a difference uh, when we look at the nasal accompaniments, because most modern Guni languages, uh, you can check this on the handout on pages three and four, they have multiple nasal click accompaniments. So why do we only want to reconstruct one, and why don't we reconstruct two, or even three. Um, so Zulu, Zimbabwe, Ndebele, Patra, Lala, Kosa, and Swati all have multiple types of nasal clicks. So why only one nasal click in Protonguni? Uh, and if there was only one nasal click in Protonguni, where does the rest come from? Well, we only want to reconstruct one nasal click because we only find regular sound correspondences for one. So the uh, the word for to help is realized as treda or treza in all Nguni languages. Uh, the word for to conquer has a nasalized alveolar click, and these all correspond very nicely. This is not the case for the other type of nasal clicks, so the ones that are described as pre-nasalized or the ones that are described as breathy voiced nasal. Uh, you either find them uh, in words that don't show regular correspondences. So for instance, the Klosa word for uh, a step has a pre-nasalized click, but, and the same word seems to occur in other Nguni languages, but in very irregular forms. It either uh, doesn't have a click or it doesn't have the nasality of the click. Uh, probably has something to do with the fact that this is quite sound symbolic and could easily have in been innovated into these, in these individual languages. We also find less sound symbolic sounding words that have these prenasalized clicks, um, but these are not shared across multiple uh, Nguni languages. These are only found in one or two individual languages. Um, so that's the main argumentation for not reconstructing more than one type of nasal click. We don't find reg uh, regular sound correspondences for more than one type of nasal click, which of course leaves us with the problem, where do they come from? Um, well, in Bantu languages, it's not so very difficult to come up with pre-nasalization because pre-nasalization is a very common morphophonological process. And this is also the case in the Nguni languages. Pre-nasalization, for instance, is used as a nominal prefix of class 9 and 10, as is very common in Bantu languages. 
And uh, nouns that have an, uh, an initial click can also occur in class 9 and 10. And in that case, the click becomes prenasalized. So these additional <coughs> prenasalized clicks seem to be the um, result of a simple language internal morphophonological process of prenasalization that already existed and already affected other sounds and um, that also started to affect clicks once clicks became part of the languages and such created prenasalized clicks. Okay, so after this very extensive uh, reconstruction uh, excursion, um, the most important thing is what can we learn from the reconstruction of clicks in uh, Nguni languages? How and when did clicks enter these languages? Um, six, well, 16 click phonemes were adopted in Proto Nguni. So Proto Nguni already had clicks and already had a very extensive system of clicks. In fact, it had a more extensive system of clicks than most modern Nguni languages have now. Um, and after these 16 clicks were adopted in Proto Nguni, there has been a lot of attrition in different Nguni languages. So all the Nguni languages have lost their palatal clicks through different kinds of sound changes. Uh, two lang Nguni languages lost their lateral clicks and another one also lost their alveolar clicks. Um, so after the adoption of um, click phonemes in Proto Nguni, it's pretty much gone downhill from there and all Nguni languages have started to simplify their click inventories. Uh, there has also been some enrichment of Nguni click inventories and that is mainly through uh, the application of prenasalization to clicks which resulted in prenasalized clicks. Um, I should also say that another argument uh, for explaining prenasalized clicks as a uh, language internal uh, process is that very few Khoisan languages have prenasalized clicks. There's only one Khoisan language uh, which is spoken in northern Botswana, so you don't expect prenasalized clicks to come from Khoisan languages. But most importantly, um, after the breakup, uh, breakup of Proto Nguni, we don't find any evidence for the enrichment of click inventories through outside sources. So we don't see any Nguni language that has clicks that we cannot account for either through Proto Nguni or through uh, language internal development. So it seems that no Nguni language has adopted new clicks from Khoisan after the Proto Nguni phase. So there was only one t a point in time when all the clicks entered the Nguni languages, which is quite a long time ago, which is at the stage of Proto Nguni, and after that, um, no changes in the click inventory took place that are not that are the result of language contact. There were changes in the click inventories, but these were all language internal changes. <coughs> so to conclude about the use of clicks in Guni languages, uh, well, this is basically what I just said, clicks entered the Guni languages through a single contact event at the level of Proton Guni, and even though there was subsequent contact between Khoisan languages and individual Nguni languages, uh, this contact did not lead to the adoption of new cliques. Um, we know that there has been contact because we see loan words, Khoisan loan words in individual Nguni languages that are not shared across the entire group, so there must have been contact, but this contact didn't lead to uh, phonological enrichment. Um, contact may have played a role in these different levels of attrition. The fact that some Bantu languages uh, lost a lot of clicks and other Bantu languages have even started to develop new clicks because we know that having click speaking neighbors really helps you preserve your click inventory. So it could be that um, after Proto Nguni language contact did play a role but in a more indirect sense that people were still in contact with speakers of click languages and therefore maintained their click systems rather than um, simplified them. Okay, so to come to some uh, general conclusions on Bantu Khoisan language contact, um, there's a lot of variation between individual contact situations. Um, and um, there are a number of different explanations for why we see such different outcomes of uh, language contact. So it could be that some contact situations were more intense than others, so that there um, was more. Uh, that there were more Khoisan speakers involved relative to the number of Bantu speakers, um, uh, or that 
<coughs> the contact took place for a long time or that the pr relative prestige of the course and speakers involved was higher. Um, it could also be a case of time depth, that early contact was of a different nature than late contact. And this is one of the things that I've wanted to look at by looking at clicks in Guni languages, where we can see that early contact, contact at the proton Guni stage, uh, resulted in the adoption of clicks, and later contact did not. Of course, this is just a relative chronology. I, I, I'm not confident with putting a date on proton guni, but at least we know it's, early, it's earlier than the later individual contact situations. And it could also be a case of uh, a cultural difference. So it's often been suggested that contact with, uh, with uh, pastoralists uh, was of a different kind than contact with hunter-gatherers. Pastoralists generally have somewhat larger societies, and it's been suggested that the Bantu-speaking agriculturalists had higher regard for pastoralists than they did for hunter-gatherers. This is maybe something that you also see in Eastern Africa. Um, so I think that uh, I think that looking at this relative dating of particular contact influences by trying to see if we can reconstruct them to earlier levels can tell us something about the relative chronology of uh, contact-induced changes. So there are many areas of further research. Um, in the lexicon, uh, I think that looking at lexical semantics is an interesting field to see if there are other, um, other types of semantic changes that uh, can be explained in terms of language contact. Uh, in terms of uh, phonology, there are many, many interesting phonological phenomena in Southern Bantu that are very strange. And um, Khoisan languages are, of course, a very likely donor for any kind of strange phonological phenomenon. Uh, syntax is another uh, domain where I do hope to find some kind of influence. So what Lutz was talking about earlier about the uh, object marking in Ye is something that um, once we have the comparative data from other Bantu languages, could be uh, could be an interesting case. I do know that, well, like you've shown, this happens in Kwe, but I do know that it also happens in other unrelated Khoisan languages where participant marking is really very uh, optional. So that does seem like a very Khoisan thing to do. Uh, and my own plans so far are, look, are to look at two particular Bantu languages where <coughs> we expect Khoisan influence to take place. So uh, I've talked about Ye already. Um, we know that there has been, uh, it's, it's a language with a lot of clicks, so a language where Khoisan influence has clearly taken place. Um, and also a language where we find some Khoisan influence in the morphology. Um, so clearly it's likely that there are even other kinds of phenomena to be found. Um, and another interesting Bantu language to look at is Kalahani, which is a Sutu language spoken in, in Botswana, uh, which doesn't have clicks, but where um, we do see very extensive interaction with Khoisan speakers. Uh, even nowadays, there are many, many mixed marriages between Kalahadi and uh, uh, people of Kalahadi descent and people of Khoisan descent, and uh, ongoing language shift from Khoisan languages to Kalahadi. So this is another Bantu language where Khoisan influence is likely to be found. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hilda. We'll take questions, comments. Thank you very much. You know, I'm curious, I, I have never followed it up, but I think there's quite a bit of literature, mainly from South Africa, on how did clicks end up in Bantu. So there's two things I remember. One is, which is actually not from South Africa, I think it's Anna Fossen actually, who talks about the Klonipa. So there's a social linguistic story that, you know, it's avoided, if you avoid something that you use the click. Um, and the other thing is that that's slightly more obscure. You know, in source library, there are little booklets from, you know, some meeting in South Africa in the 1970s. And there's a chap called Sneiman, I think he's called. And they spent a lot of time figuring out in which syllabic position which click occurs, and then trying to, through that, have sort of a structure analysis, you know, so on, 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 on the, I guess, syllabic distribution type, how this contact happens. But, um, so, mm. so, so what I want, what I wanted with that is, I think that that for them, I think, but I never really thought that it's to do also with which loan what carried which click because, like in, in your analysis, it sounds a bit like there's loan words which is fine, 
And then there's clip boring, so there's a phonetic or phonological contact. But, but for this earlier research, I think they were quite concerned to try tie particular click phenomena to particular words. And then I, you know, they didn't have, I think, the phonema, but it was also then trying to look to semantic dimension or something. Mm -hmm. But, so I don't know the literature about it, I was wondering whether you have to look at that. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Sonipa story is, of course, yeah, is, is one of the main explanations for the, the how, particularly, and that mainly explains why you find clicks in native Bantu words and not only in, uh, in borrowings. Um, yeah, it, it's probably a quite good explanation because the languages where you have Sonipa correspond very well with the languages where you have clicks. Um, it's also been suggested that the entire practice of Sonipa is, of course, on origin itself. Uh, so that explains why clicks and flunipa uh, co-occur so well. Uh, yeah, when it comes to syllabic positions, one of the things that bothered these people is that you find um, medial clicks, so not in C1 position, which is not where you can find them in Khoisan languages ever. They always have to be at the beginning of the root. Um, so uh, there, there is, uh, it's been suggested that those are compounds in the original language, but there are also many cases where um, uh, where it's simply a case of click insertion in Bantu. Uh, one of the problems with these these earlier South African um, analyses is that they link any Khoisan language to any Bantu language. So one of the, I mean, Snyman's research on Khoisan is very good, but what he does is he links Jutwan, which is spoken in northern Namibia, to Nguni languages, and there's no evidence at all that these were ever spoken close to each other, and that um, Jutwan is uh, at all related to anything that was spoken close to uh, to Nguni. So what he finds is probably uh, is probably accidental. There's it's it's really hard to find good correspondences between Khoisan and Bantu because the languages are so different and Khoisan is phonologic phonologically so much more complex that you have so much simplification that anything could correspond to anything basically. It's not, yeah, thank you. It's not a very well formulated uh, <laughs> comment or a question. It was, it's linking back to the point that you raised about why don't you find this, for example, in East African Bantu languages and the bit about the time depth. So, would your, so, yeah, so how do you sort of square those things? So, if you're saying actually these clips are from Proto and Nguni, and no, if I've answered correctly, like nothing has then been. These things haven't happened since. Then presumably you can put that across to East Africa, perhaps mapping on the different societal structures and the pastoralists and these kind of explanations as well, and say well, nothing was borrowed or, or whatever in those languages, and so that's why you didn't have borrowing, or why you don't find clicks in East African Bantu languages as well. Is that, is that um, so? So it's taking your sort of explanation of what's going on in in southern Africa and extending it to East Africa, you don't have borrowing of clicks in East African Bantu languages because the time depth, what was happening then, it would have had to be borrowed too long ago. Yeah, I think I think that's that's probably it, that uh, the East African situation has a, has a much deeper time depth yeah. and um, this, this seems to suggest that the South African results seem to suggest that uh, earlier contact was of a, of the kind that you get phonological influence, and if the same is true in East Africa, uh, I don't know if it is, but if, then of course you have a few centuries more in East Africa, and they, they would have disappeared by then, because we do know that that is what clicks do, they disappear or they erode over time, unless you have clicks to keep your system up. So yeah, it could be, it could simply be a, a, a time depth difference. 